but thank you for inviting me. This is always a delight for me to be able to be here and, and spend a little time with you all. Uh, David Romero, thank you for being here. You are a, a definitely a positive role model to our students. We appreciate you giving your time to share your wisdom, to share your expertise with our students who are so much um, hungry. And we're not just the students, all of us, we're all so hungry to hear your message and to hear all these wonderful things that you're doing. So thank you for being here. Um, to Professor Estrada, thank you for inviting me to come here and just say hello. And you know, if, I wish we were in person, but you know, this is the best we can do now, right, virtually. Uh, but I look forward to the day that where I come to your class, uh, Professor Estrada, and sit there with the students and listen to your guest. Uh, and, so I'm here to simply say hello, to welcome you, and to thank you on behalf of the college for doing these very important events for our students and for our community. Oh, Dr. Lopez, this is one of my absolute favorite things to do. And um, if somebody remind me to, to just do a few more, uh, I got another event coming up on the 27th with Teatro Chicana. That is going to be amazing. These, these street performers from the 60s and 70s were so critical in our history. But I, I love this. I love sharing love of literature, love of poetry. I believe that reading should be a human right. And none other than David Romero, who to me is one, of, and I'm not just saying this because I love you, brother. David is one of the most talented Latinx poets of our time. He is, his energy is amazing. His advice is wonderful. Not only is he a poet, but he's also a community educator that's really grassroots. And I've, I've admired uh, David for a really long time. Um, he also has a scholarship that he funds himself for students. And as someone who also chairs a couple of scholarship committees, it's a lot of work, you know, but uh, his work is tremendous. Uh, I, I, I had the copy on hand to show you the cover, but um, my name is Romero, such a beautiful collection. And um, just, just so honored to have him again. And uh, I don't know what else to say other than just immerse yourself in, in his amazing poetry, and he's also super funny too, so I love having him here. But David, welcome, welcome to your second home. Well, after uh, those sets of in introductions from uh, President Lopez and, and Dr. Estrada, who uh, organized this event, uh, you almost made me cry right off the top here. That was very beautiful and very appreciated. Um, it's an honor to join you here today. Um, so the first poem that I'm going to perform and of course, thank you uh, to uh, Professor Del Toro for bringing in her class, Much, very much appreciated. Um, so the first poem that I'm going to be sharing with you today is uh, the story of an undocumented student athlete. Uh, this poem is inspired by two people, uh, one being an uh, undocumented student athlete, uh, Isaac Barrera, who played for uh, uh, Belmont High School. He was a running back uh, there, and I met him at a community art space called Corazon del Pueblo, in Boyle Heights. And the second would be my father who attended Roosevelt High School, a very famous high school uh, 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 in a very historic neighborhood of Boyle Heights, uh, Los Angeles. Um, so yeah, this poem is called Undocumented Football. When life throws everything at you, don't drop the ball. Don't drop the ball. Blue, 42, set. Hike a brown quarterback's fingers tighten around the white faces of a football. Roosevelt versus Garfield, they meet today upon an annual battleground where local legends spell rivalry in defensive and offensive formations. Upon this old field, in this dirty stadium, football sounds a lot like Boyle Heights like East LA, like years of pride in history. Sounds like Roosevelt is in motion number 42. Miguel is with them crossing the line of scrimmage clad in red and yellow. His muscles tell a story. Miguel has always been running, running from La Migra, Las Vacas, everyone who wants to stop him, ask him, ¿Dónde están los papeles? Where are your papers? Miguel's too fast though. How fast? 
Too fast, too fast for borders, laws, checkpoints, dogs, too fast for fences, ditches, detention centers, and walls. Definitely too fast for the fool. Unfortunate enough to be Dean up on him now. Through it all, under the glare of stadium lights, past the cheering, booing, chanting, and screaming, through a maze of players like a beam of holy light, Miguel's vision is clear. He loves this game. It gives him focus, gave him purpose. Miguel will be defined by this moment. He knows this. No college will recruit him. His record doesn't really scream draft pick, but that's not the issue. Miguel never cared for politics. He just loved his coach, his team, this American game of football, his dream to make a catch in the only important game that he could. Miguel will not score the winning touchdown. This game will be added to a losing record that will make for a losing season. There are so many reasons for Miguel to drop the ball. Walk out of the stadium, just another statistic. Undocumented student, faceless immigrant. There are so many reasons for Miguel to drop the ball. So as it spirals towards him, carrying the weight of a future unfathomable, he repeats to himself like a prayer, don't drop the ball, don't drop the ball. So he catches it like how he catches his diploma, like how he catches his degree, like how he catches the hand of his high school sweetheart and they cross the threshold of that goal line together. He cradles the ball in his arms like his son John, firstborn legal, firstborn free to pursue his dreams and not always be running. So damn hard. This is just one story from the East LA Classic. Roosevelt versus Garfield, just one game for Miguel of undocumented football. Thank you, thank you. Uh, virtual, yes. So yeah, so it's an honor to join you here today. Um, I'm once again, very grateful uh, to be here. Uh, just in case you didn't uh, see my name on the uh, on the flyer, uh, <laughs> it's David A. Romero. Um, I, I've performed at uh, 75 colleges and universities. Uh, my book, My Name is Romero, is out now from uh, Flower Song Press. All of the poems that I will be reading today are from this. Uh, Flower Song Press is an emerging uh, press from McAllen, Texas. Uh, this year, though, they have had, uh, or the past couple of years, they have had the uh, honor of uh, publishing books from uh, Alarista, uh, 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 Something from Urea is forthcoming, uh, Luis Alberto Urea. Uh, they've also uh, published figures such as Brianna Munoz, Matt Cedillo, uh, uh, and uh, Gre uh, Grace Munoz. Um, so yes, a lot of names, a lot, many more people. Uh, Sonia Gutierrez, another uh, excellent author, and many, many, many more. David, I'm, uh, I'm surprised Urea is going with an independent press. That, that's surprising to me. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, uh, Urea, um, Urea has a reputation of actually being very supportive. Um, oh. For example, he wrote the foreword uh, to uh, Gris Munoz's uh, book of poetry. Oh, nice. And, uh, yeah, and that was her debut. So, uh, yes, uh, from what I've heard around town from, from the campfires is that he, uh, you know, he will write reviews, he'll write blurbs, he'll, uh, and some of his, um, you know, material, uh, you know, uh, to, to call it B-sides, you know, I, I guess would be apt, but, you know, from such a great figure as himself, even the B-sides are, you know, phenomenal. So his B-sides would be some of our A-sides, you know, sometimes. So, but um, yeah, you know, having a place, having a home to publish that is really neat. Um, so yeah, um, the next poem that I'm going to, um, I'm going to read is one that I don't read that often. Um, but I really love it. I, th I think it's interesting. Um, this poem is about um, indigenous people, specifically uh, the Native Americans within the uh, current continental boundaries of the United States. Um, and it starts off being about cultural appropriation. Um, so I hope you enjoy it. It's called Who Wins? Flip on the TV, turn on the radio, the game is on. You lazily ask, who's winning? The Atlanta Braves, the Kansas City Chiefs, the Washington Redskins are playing. You change the channel. The hipsters are going native. 
with dream catchers hanging over their beds and their rear view mirrors. They're diffusing accusations of racism by saying they're 1 16th Cherokee. You can hear indigenous flutes playing in their psalms, see Coco Pelli welcome mats under their doors. They're running into the woods, partying in the desert at outdoor festivals with war paint and headdresses, doing drugs once considered sacred, so wild and free on top, on top of stolen land. They're screaming and dancing. They're shrugging off questions of cultural appropriation, getting philosophical as they get defensive. Feels like you're trying to start an argument with that. And the thing about that is, who wins? You change the channel. Apocalypse Now, Predator, 28 days later, the white savior covers himself with mud, strips naked, howls into the night, alone in the wilderness, he must plunge into the heart of darkness. To win, our hero must go native. Change the channel. Now for something classic. Cowboys, Indians, bows, arrows, feathers, horses, wagon trains, and gunshots. You know who will ride on, and you know who will fall. You know who wins. Change the channel. It's Pocahontas, Peter Pan, and Tiger Lily. The beautiful Native American woman must be won over, saved from the evil clutches of the savage red man. Change the channel. It's a documentary. It's history. Native Americans lose everything. They fall to disease, to genocide, to poverty, to alcoholism, to rape. First Nation peoples almost extinct. This kind of bums you out, so you change the channel. It's a commercial for a Native American casino. You like this channel. The bright lights, the polished walls of the brand new establishment. Someone says, heck, they're the ones winning now. Turn the TV off. Do some research. 15% Native American unemployment, less than 12,000 annual Native American per capita income, over 28 billion made in tribal gaming last year. Sounds like a big win. You know who also made a killing in America last year? JP Morgan Chase, Wells Fargo, Exxon Mobil. How did it feel when you got a piece of those winnings? That's right, you didn't. The tables are rigged, the house always wins, the slot machines spew broken promises, broken treaties, with dates ranging from 1890 to 1770. These coins they claim, they clash, the sound is deafening, dead presidents pressed on metal, printed on paper, whose value is the perception of trust. If you could gather them all up, the falseness, the falsehood, the toll, the cost, the bloodshed, the heartbreak, the weight of it all, the loss would crush you and butcher everything that you love, like pale horses and buffalo on a field of blood in a house with a TV set. It's the victors who ask, who wins? All right. That's beautiful. So thank you. <laughs> so thank you very if much. It's okay with you, compañero. I'm gonna just intermittently ask people if they have questions or comments. Just write stack in the chat. You're more than welcome to ask your question. You can have your camera on or off. If you want to be spotlighted, I can totally do that. But um, just a reminder that I'm recording and I will put this in an enlisted YouTube channel. If this is that okay with you, David? I know we didn't talk in advance, but just to have questions between the readings, is that cool? No, absolutely, absolutely. We and, can uh, fill this out however people uh yeah, well, how are the 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 mood? <laughs> right. And Juanita, if you want to ask your students questions or if there is a course theme you want to elevate, by all means, feel free to chime in. So does okay. anyone have questions for David? Thank you. No, no, my pleasure. Or um, Dr. Lopez, of course, you're always welcome to ask the, the wonderful questions you do or, or have a comment. You're welcome to chat it or speak it out. Anybody? No, 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 no pressure. You've been getting a lot of love. I don't know if you've been seeing all the the, the oh. snaps and my son is loving your poetry. Antonio, you can also- Oh, nice. Thanks, Antonio. Appreciate it. Well, I, as we wait for questions, I just, you know, your your poem on, about the undocumented, uh, um, you know, it's it really hits home for me because I was a former undocumented student myself. And so I, as I was listening, it was reminding, I was uh, remembering 
when I was an undocumented student myself. And, you know, even after many years of being here, I still feel undocumented sometimes, uh, you know, and many of our students are undocumented here at Herald. And I think uh, writing a, a poem that addresses this issue, it's really uh, hits home for many of us. So thank you for doing that, David. I don't know if you knew that about our students. Uh, and just in general, you know, when I think about all of these things that have been happening or not happening in terms of the government and DACA and all of these different things, you know, it's just, it's, it's an issue that we continue to, to have and unfortunately we haven't resolved. Uh, and so just, just so you know that uh, without probably even planning on your end, uh, I think it hit the core for many of us here at the college. So thank you. I, I agree, oh. that poem was perfect to start and beautiful. And just, a, um, it's not a question, it just reminded me in juxtaposition with the Native American poem um, when undocumented people were crossing the border, I am from Arizona originally between Yuma and Summerton, the Cocopa Nation allowed them to, to cross. And if you know the Minutemen, this is a militant racist group that was trying to hunt down these undocumented people. And those Cocopa Native Americans basically said, this is our land, you get out. And that was such a beautiful moment of solidarity. Um, uh, yeah, that, that it, it touched my heart because we we live in our silos even there, right? And so even though I live next to the Cocoa Bar Reservation, ironically, I didn't really encounter them until I went to high school and then they opened up a casino. But it's the same dynamic you're talking about. People make assumptions about, anyway, I'm talking about too many topics, but that that solidarity, that move, that compassion still still sits home with me. And, and I think this, it's, it's what we need in this country. We need to have open doors, open borders um, to, to welcome people. But to take that principal stance against fascism was so beautiful. It didn't get as much attention as it should have, but it made a very short article in one of the newspapers from back home, you know? But um, so you're getting love in the chat. Isabel says, I'm in awe, your poems are amazing. Jonathan says, uh, love that your poems are nothing but facts. Whoa! And uh, um, Giselle says, yes, I was not familiar with your work beforehand, but I'm very happy to be here and hear some of your poems that have seriously hit the heart. Oh, thanks, Giselle. Oh, All right. Wow. All right. Uh, so I was, uh, uh, thank, thank you very much. Uh, so I was billed at the top of this program of being very funny. Um, so far, this hasn't been very funny. Um, so, so I'm going to go ahead and uh, perform a, a, a funny poem. Uh, uh, so-called. Um, this poem also deals with cultural appropriation, and this poem mostly deals with the appropriation of the cuisines of our uh, Latinx, specific, specifically our Chicanx uh, people, um, Mexican Americans or, or Mexicans in this country uh, by the mainstream. And very often it's some of our own people who are doing the poaching, who are being put. Actually, I met someone at a uh, family party who uh, uh, she told me that she worked at Taco Bell's test kitchen. And I said, what, a test kitchen, what is that? And she said that it's a uh, kitchen that is made, it's designed in the same format that all of the Taco Bell kitchens are designed in. And they have all of the ingredients that they would use at any Taco Bell. And their job is to replicate the cuisines of indigenous peoples, you know, uh, our long standing histories in this kitchen, you know, so that's how we get the thing like the Taco Bell Chalupa and, you know, all of these other weird, you know, uh, Frankenstein type creations in these things um, for mass market consumption is through this process. Um, so this poem is called, uh, oh, I had it, I had it uh, uh, turned to another poem about food. My mistake, I was, uh, <laughs> I was ready, to, ready to start reading the wrong poem. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. This poem is uh, That's a Wrap slash Ode to the Burrito. It starts off with a little, little step. Oh my God, I've got the greatest idea. We'll take the pride of your people, the most significant dish your culture has ever produced, and we'll turn it into a sandwich. No, a salad. No, a hamburger 
No, no, no. I got it. We'll throw it all on top of a doughy flour tortilla and just wrap it up. Oh, hell no. The seventh seal was broken. The seventh trumpet was sounded. And from the seas arose a dark and unholy beast. Its name featured on fast food menus and neon signs all over the country. The wrapped, the focus group of foods, who were assembled from the rotting carcasses of recipes killed by cultural appropriation, who are a Frankenstein, a monster. And for those travelers who journeyed throughout Mexico and the Southwest on burros, who invented the burrito, the little donkey, you are truly an ass. Scraps of better foods whose quality was sacrificed at the unholy altar of on the go. You are simultaneously warm chicken and cool salad. You are lukewarm. I will spit you out and reject you as they reject us. Those who want to cash in on the popularity of the burrito but deny Spanish from the menu. Those who love Mexican food, but hate Mexicans. And what have we given to the world? The burrito is a pillow for your mouth. It is a voluptuous breast, a full butt cheek. It is carne asada, carnitas, and not ground beef with a side of beans and rice. Guacamole, please, but no pinche sour cream. A burrito is quite simply an essay on humanity's struggle for greatness. Greatness achieved. It is all the things that a wrap is not. Burn wraps forever. Burn all images of their name and likeness in effigy. And on that brave new day, you'll find me at El Tepeyac in Boyle Heights, Los Angeles, <laughs> eating a burrito as big as your head, the end. All right, all right, so I'm glad. Dude, you yeah, so that California. That was so amazing. <laughs> that was amazing. I think maybe now the students may want to ask questions. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm seeing, uh, yes, Professor Del Toro showing some love for El Tepeyac. It, yep. is, it is truly, truly yep. historic. You've been there. <laughs> yes, I have. Yes, I'm from California. <laughs> nice. Have, have, you ever, have you ever tried to eat the, the manual special? No, no, I'm, I, no. <laughs> Can't do it. <laughs> Is this the historical we, uh, like, restaurant? Yeah, we really, we almost fell over. David, <laughs> Glory, Glory has a question. Go ahead, Miha. Oh, Sorry, good. I didn't mean to interrupt. Oh, I just, okay, I don't, I, I'm not from Cal, I'm from Chicago, so I don't know what, um, El Tepeyac, or how do you say it? Sorry, I don't mean to. Yeah, uh, El Tepeyac, so, um, so based upon the uh, Juan Diego, the Virgin Mary, that, that place being the inspiration for it, um, but uh, yeah, so it's it's a generational uh, a Mexican restaurant, um, uh, well beloved uh, in the community of uh, Boyle Heights on Evergreen Street and uh, and Wabash. Um, but uh, yeah, it's uh, um, they're very famous for this very large burrito called the Manuel Special. Manuel was the owner um, uh, and the the head cook of the of the restaurant, and a really great guy, really funny. Uh, knew everybody's name who would come in, uh, you know, including my dad uh, was one of the people who would go, go in there as a kid. And, uh, you know, he would chastise him and, and whatnot. But uh, yeah, anyway, so the Manuel special named after the owner of Manuel or Manuel um, is, uh, and that's actually a very interesting generational thing because that generation of Chicanos, Chicanics, you know, people very often would prefer the anglicized version of their name. So it actually took precedence over the the Spanish pronunciation um, but anyways really big burrito can't eat it in one sitting or if you can you're you're going to be absolutely miserable afterwards it's, it's huge so it's really more of like a party type platter uh situation but yeah yeah it's definitely um a place that has uh gained 
you know, international attention. Uh, fortunately, like a lot of things, you know, out of Boyle Heights, um, for example, I referenced um, the um, the East LA Classic in uh, my first poem, and uh, that is a, uh, a a game that's played between um, the rival high schools of Garfield and Roosevelt, representing the communities of East LA and Boyle Heights, which are right next to each other. So Boyle Heights is very often confused as being part of uh, East LA, uh, but it's this long-standing rivalry between the two, and it's something that's actually gained uh, recognition to um, on a national scale as well. Um, it's actually uh, the rivalry game is actually nationally televised. But yeah, there are certain things that are, um, you know, it's very fortunate. Um, but at the same time, you know, it is an ongoing struggle for the people in that community, which it, it is uh, largely an immigrant uh, uh, community um, to while there is this certain all of these things going on to um, to have access to resources, education, healthcare. Uh, public transportation, uh, you name it. Um, so it yeah. It sounds like Chicago. <laughs> I mean, really, we're a segregated city and uh, the environmental devastation of our black and brown communities, we're living it, you know? But um, I, I just think kind of rando, but it, it uh, I mean, we're all part of the system, right? That's the problem. And one of the things that fascinates me is fusion food. And I love my sushi burritos, but I can imagine the Japanese people are like, a sushi burrito like this is a monstrosity it's got no delicacy no no like yeah, beauty they probably see it as some kind of like horrible amalgamation my son is saying they probably see it as a horrible amalgamation and it has been undone by the sushi pizza what oh wow seriously oh, dude just, know, might as well just give us a whole damn fish right like on a platter right but um yeah so i, I don't know i i think that 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 is a really outstanding criticism um i also get I get angry when people give me a chile relleno that's not really a chile relleno and they'll like take rajas and put it between eggs to accommodate uh, an Anglo, you know, consumer. And so I return the plate and I'm like, no, you give me my chile relleno how it should be, not this crap. And don't give me no enchilada sauce from the can. You know what I'm saying? Or mm. more from the jar. Mm. Oh, I hate that. But that's another thing. Like they've not only misappropriated our culture, they, they turn it into this, this, disgusting thing that you know people really shouldn't be eating i, I hate to say you know? <laughs> like, like... yeah yeah i mean it is it is very interesting for example um i came across a student who uh he said i love rats and uh he was latino and he really he wanted to like get into a true uh, you know to uh, a, a fight over this you know um i was like hey you know i'm not you know you like raps whatever you know you, you want me to fight you i you know i don't i don't have that much passion <laughs> aside from this poem you know in real life to be to be getting into a fight with you o over raps you know but uh you know so people are going to like what they like but i think what's interesting about what you are saying uh dr estrada is um yeah is that um you know, very often with these, the situation with these fusion foods is that someone could come across it and be offended or other people could see it as a sign of the deep cultural appreciation. So that's, you know, the difference between those two words and, you know, appreciation, appropriation, and one person's appreciation may be another's appropriation and, and vice versa. So it is a very nuanced feel. You know, generally what we're looking for is, you know, these questions about, do they understand the original context? You know, who is doing this? Do they understand the original context of what they're using? And uh, do they give respect and recognition to the originators? And, uh, and then lastly, who benefits is a big question. So I think that that's a big thing when we're talking about, you know, these small, you know, restaurants or, you know, food trucks or even, you know, conglomerations or home cooks, you know, definitely. Um, and I think it's, you know, less of a question of, of appropriation, but once you get to these mega, you know, international uh, food conglomerates, you know, such as Taco Bell, you know, and they're, and they're mashing all of these things together, I think it, it becomes uh, uh, qualified, uh, it changes in quality, um, as, as we would use in the league, you know, the difference between quantity and quality. Um, so the quality of what is happening uh, actually changes. Right. Um, and I think that's an excellent explanation. And, and I want to just uplift what Jonathan said. I agree with you 100 percent. 
He says, I feel like it should be an unwritten rule that if you don't like a certain group of people, then you have no right to eat their food and you celebrate their culture. <laughs> Good one. I, I agree. Um, and what kind of celebration is it? I'm so tired of seeing people in sombreros. It's, it's yes. so damn patronizing. And um, e even, even oh, I can tell you stories, but there has to be a way to educate people without punching them in the face. You know what I'm saying? And, and it's hard sometimes not to get angry, especially when people are being absurd. Um, but I, I think this is amazing. Yeah, beautiful, oh. beautiful. <clears throat> oh, nice, nice, nice. Um, you were talking about uh, something, uh, Dr. Estrada, that reminded me of another poem that I don't perform that often, but it is very political. So if um, if y'all are, uh, uh, you know, love that fire, <laughs> then, uh, then here we go. Uh, so this poem is called Patriots and Lunatics, and this actually refers to um, uh, Minutemen groups. Um, and, and the Minutemen proper and, uh, and issues around the border uh, with vigilantes. It would be a disservice to give self-appointed patriots dirt and grit, stars and stripes, red-blooded Americans, the title lunatic, except when it fits them as comfortably as orange jumpsuits or pine box coffins. Chris Simcox was a man with an American dream. Move out to the Southwest, grab some guns, take a last stand like Wyatt Earp at the OK Corral, shoot it out until the bitter end. Aside from the usual delusions of grandeur, Chris Simcox, co-founder of the Minutemen, harbored a much darker secret. At night, we arrive. Never me, not I, I've never been there when they crossed from Sonora to Arizona, Chihuahua to Texas, but I know it. Not the types to be intimidated by a line on a map, a line in the sand or a river. I picture them emerging from the water indignant, clothes soaked, wet shirts and blouses over wet backs. They call them wet backs as if somehow the strength in them to carry adversity would be grounds for anything derogatory. You should add alert eyes, calloused hands, muscled torsos, sun-hardened skin, tired and dehydrated but still running legs to that long list of epithets. Wet back is just another word for survivor. There were no survivors. Home Massacre, Jason J.T. Reddy, neo-Nazi, former member of the Minutemen put a gun to his head, but not before murdering his girlfriend, her daughter, her daughter's boyfriend, and their child. Resenia Flores was nine years old when she was murdered by the Minutemen. Shauna Ford, Jason Eugene Bush, Albert Gaxiola, two Minutemen and their guide crept into the Flores house under the cover of night looking for drugs. They didn't find any, so they shot Brisenia. Her mother and her father stole their jewelry, rode back to their hideout, didn't make out with much, not enough to cover the cost of a new headquarters. See, these vigilantes had a patriotic plan. They were going to rob them some Mexicans to fund the training and arming of more Minutemen because it's Mexicans who are the dangerous ones, right? Chris Simcox co-founder of the Minutemen, has a problem, has a disease. This defender of American values and American children couldn't stop himself from touching them. Three girls under the age of 10, five counts of pedophilia, including acts perpetrated against his own daughter. I am glad that our borders are kept safe by patriots and lunatics, dead or locked up for now, while more cowboys, vigilantes, neo-Nazis, pedophiles, murderers, and Minutemen ride off into the sunset. They ride with blood on their hands, waiting for us to finally bury them. All right. So this, uh, this poem actually ties into um, a workshop that I do on victims of hate crimes and police brutality. Um, and one of my 
One of my biggest uh, goals uh, with that workshop was to uh, draw parallels between different struggles, um, between the um, anti-LGBT violence um, that, that some communities experience with the rampant anti-Blackness uh, that, that uh, we see very often um, carried out uh, with the police, with also the anti-Latinx uh, violence that is expressed, how often um, gang members or just suspected, suspected gang members are very often shot in the back and then handcuffed, as well as the hate crimes that we would see um, on the border by, these, uh, by the Minutemen and uh, these fringe groups that would ally themselves uh, with the Minutemen. Now, a few years ago, uh, leading up to the presidency of uh, Donald Trump, there was a rampant rise um, in this kind of violence and this kind of activity. And in fact, uh, this character, uh, character, this real person um, who, who was the founder of the Minutemen group, um, this group that you know, would be covered on Fox News, and he himself, Chris Simcox, rose to such a position of power that he was speaking on national media platforms and being invited as a guest um, and even ran for Senate. Um, and, and his campaign was building. And it is a very fortunate thing um, that it was revealed that he was a pedophile. Um, but that just goes to show, you know, in talking about these things is that when we hear these statements of racism, you know, from people like Donald Trump, um, when we hear these people, you know, outright saying these things, you know, chances are they're really bad people. They're not just misunderstood or, you know, whatever these things we hear, you know, very often, you know, in the media is kind of like, uh, oh, they're, you know, a, a symbolic of white working class resentment or, you know, they're distrustful of power structures or, or they're trying to drain the swamp or, you know, whatever it is, you know, they're fighting against the deep state. No, these people are racist and they're terrified of the fact that the United States by 2044 is bound to be a minority majority nation. They knew that they built this country on racism, on genocide, and that they're losing it, that they are inevitably losing control of this country. So, um, you know, a place for this kind of hate, you know, it just can't stand. And there are certain extreme expressions of it, you know, as we see on the border with these vigilante groups, particularly, that really have to go. There is, there is no compromise um, um, with these people. And so, you know, to pick it up with the top is that I acknowledge this idea of like patriotism, red-blooded Americans, this and that, and then build to a um, a conclusion, you know, because that's what the romance that a lot of these people have about themselves is that, is that they are modern cowboys and, and that, that somehow is a good thing. <laughs> when we know today that a lot of these cowboys and a lot of these frontiers people and all these people, yeah, Someone just said it right here in, in, in the comments, you know, you have to call it what it is, racism and genocide. And that's exactly what it, what it is. That's the legacy that we still need to, you know, uproot. And, and David, if I could just chime in here in the Midwest, it's the Proud Boys that are taking guns to rally, shooting at people. And again, they get elevated by Fox, by, by the mainstream media, even when it's just a few of them and you see Black Lives Matter protesters in the thousands and like 20 proud boys and who gets the attention the damn proud boys. They're fascists. I don't care what they say. I don't care what they stand for. They're, they're, they're a racist hate group. And if you call it what it is, they want genocide, right? Um, right. And uh, I, 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 um, what really disgusted me and still does is how they would talk about the children that are still in cages you know, mm -hmm. it's so dehumanizing that I'm like, damn, what is happening to our country when children are talked about in such a vile manner? These are kids, right? Um, and, and yeah, I, I, think, I think we need to do more of this. I, I didn't know you did those workshops. So that was pretty damn amazing. You should do one of those at our college. But um, oh. yeah, Glory says it reminds them, yeah, Texas Rangers, Texas Rangers who were 
you know, the, the star wielding sheriffs would, would mm. hang Mexicans, often over land disputes, right? So uh, in the sea, yeah, they were saying that the, the poem was powerful, but tough. And I said, yo, that poem is powerful, but necessary. We, we got it. We got to, you know, that's beautiful. Yeah, for sport. Does anybody else want to ask David questions or ha have a thought about what, what this, this really is important topic that he's, he's, uh, he's talking about? I feel like I always kill the conversation. Bad teacher, bad teacher. <laughs> well, keep keep going, brothers. This is amazing. All right. Um, so let's see here. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, okay. Actually, I'll do something fun. <laughs> uh, uh, where can I find the book? Uh, the best place to find the book, uh, Gabriella, thank you for asking, is um, on my website, uh, davidaromero.com. Uh, you can get your... You can get your book signed by me, which is even better than getting it from uh, Flower Song Press, uh, my publisher. And wow, amazing. I will actually also throw in a magnet with it, uh, with this beautiful artwork, uh, which is the cover, um, yeah, side by side, uh, by my cousin, the, uh, the illustrious uh, Sonia Romero, uh, daughter of Frank Romero. Uh, my uncle, her father, uh, famous uh, Chicano uh, muralist, low spore and um, credits, you know, beyond. Um, but yeah, actually, okay, now, now that I've delved into nepotism, now that we've gone into that well, I guess I may as well perform. This is a poem um, about my, my uncle, um, about the impact that he had on me. Um, this is a poem um, about art and about how um, very often we as uh, Latinx people can be, uh, our, you know, our accomplishments will be denigrated, will be trivialized, will be marginalized. Um, and uh, even as we accomplish great things, we're constantly doubted. Um, question if we have a place in the building, as it were, or in the pantheon of greatness. Um, so this poem is called Micro Machines. It's about microaggressions. Mexican kid with white skin and blue eyes knows a lot about art. This brings a smile to the white face of a museum docent. She asks the boy how he knows so much. The boy replies, my uncle is an artist. The boy says this without a hint of cynicism or derision. This to him is the greatest thing a person can be, an artist. The docent asks the boy, What's his name? Frank Romero. What does your uncle paint? Cars. He paints old cars. American cars from the 1920s through 50s. LA, palm trees, freeways, and familiar streets as the background, always bold in color with a zigzagged impasto stroke, the kind of thing you see that immediately makes you say, that's a Romero. The boy suggests to the docent, maybe he has something here. A pause from her then, there's an auto museum down the street. Maybe he has something there. No, that doesn't seem right. Maybe what you mean is he paints cars. There's a dusty wood and tin garage under this museum, and the docent has put his uncle into it. They call this aggression, but really it's so easy as she does it. But his uncle doesn't look the same there. His uncle with bold striped sweaters, full wild hair and beard, laugh big enough to fill a room, larger than life personality, looks very different in the docent's garage. To her, his uncle is a tiny uncle with a shaved head, Brown Pendleton and Dickies, navy work apron and silver paint spray can in hand. He paints with that in place of a brush. The cars in the garage are smaller too. They're micro machines. And like them, the boy feels small and getting smaller. His hopes, his pride, all the world and its colors shrinking to a vanishing point. 
because he knows what she means. I know what she meant. I couldn't expand upon these ideas fast enough. There is nothing wrong with painting cars, painting pictures of cars, or dressing like a cholo, but we are not all the same. You can't paint us all with the same brush, fit us all into the same stroke, Whatever the medium, there's nothing wrong with taking pride in your work, but what is wrong is for anyone to assume that we are a smaller people, a lesser people. It is wrong to assume that any one of us can't be acclaimed, can't hang in your museum. Give him the top floor because my uncle is an artist a painter. His work has hung in galleries the world over. You can find him in the Smithsonian, see his mural in LA by the 101, and yes, he, like me, is a Mexican. My uncle is an artist, a painter, who's been paid to paint cars that were literally bigger than the Mona Lisa. My uncle is an artist, a painter, and like me, he knows how to use the principle a diminution, which is making objects appear smaller in a piece of art to help create a sense of perspective. My uncle is an artist, a painter, and he doesn't get paid to talk about painting. He gets paid to paint them with checks bigger than your desperate attempts to try and reframe him. And I won't allow any of you to make me feel small about any of us ever again. I love that poem, it's amazing. Well, we have about nine minutes left. Um, unless you wanna close, I actually wanted you to perform that poem. If, if maybe uh, students who haven't had a chance to speak or ask questions or Juanita, she was giving love to your piece earlier. Anybody have questions? Isabel, you've been giving him a lot of love. You want to ask him a question? <laughs> She's laughing. Or anybody else? No, I don't have anything in mind. I don't, I don't know. I'm just like taking it all in. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. This is, uh, yeah, just to uh, uh, put this into perspective, um, you know, this is uh, the result many years of writing, many years of working on my craft. Um, you know, this this doesn't come overnight. Um, I start with, um, you know, writing poems as a hobby, um, or actually freestyle rapping, uh, which, you know, I thought I was very good, but <laughs> I've, I've listened to some of those old tapes, you know, back in the day, you know, we, we had to record things, you know, on tapes or, uh, you know, short little clips on phones or, or whatnot you know, video cameras that we would then have to digitize and through, through all of that stuff. I wasn't very good. <laughs> you know, it was, a, it was a hard, in the moment, you know, at those parties, I, I thought I was great. You know, I thought I was, I, I was ripping it up. But, um, but I just have to say that, um, yeah, you know, this, this particular book uh, took a decade to write. And there was a lot of like process of, um, you know, editing and, and taking poems out and putting them back in and thinking, okay, like, you know, what's a good topic? What will kind of round out this theme of, uh, you know, Latinx identity, uh, specifically, you know, with, with me, a lot of my work, you know, is kind of built around uh, the fact of passing, you know, for white. So a constant need to, um, you know, validate oneself or to uh, <laughs> apologize for oneself, you know, for being such a pocho. Um, and uh, yeah, so, you know, kind of going through that whole process and what I think is really beautiful as well as the politics, you know, so I, I kind of came into activism um, in college, um, becoming aware of a lot of different issues, you know, uh, uh, human rights, workers, you know, issues and, and whatnot. And, um, and then, uh, you know, uh, imperialism, capitalism, you know, communism, socialism, you know, a lot of these different isms um, and, and writing about them, uh, colonialism being another huge theme of my book. But uh, yeah, in the vein, so, so to tie that all up is, uh, yeah, I just, just, just kind of saying is that, you know, 
it took it took a lot. It was a lot, a lot of different things, and and maybe uh, you know some people feel that they don't always mesh you know well together, but that's always been always been my thing is is that I love that that's the power that poetry you know enables uh, a, a performer or a writer is to be able to um, you know be very funny to try to examine a serious topic like uh, uh, cultural appropriation you know, with the lens of humor in one moment and then give a very detailed, almost uh, journalistic uh, type of analysis of um, vigilanteism um, in the next. Um, so I'm, yeah, I, it's just really great to be able to uh, write and perform and, and speak to colleges. Um, so I'm gonna close with the uh, uh, signature poem of the book. Uh, this poem is called My Name is Romero. It's another performative poem um so let me cough <coughs> yes all right so uh what can i say about it i don't know it's it's just funny and it kind of you know ties a lot of things together here we go it happens every single night telemarketing juliet calling from the ivy covered balconies Calling for their star-crossed lovers. Calling. Hello, is Mr. Romeo in? I'm sorry. Romeo went to go grab a burrito. Mercutio to cruise Whittier Boulevard and Shakespeare to take some ethnic studies lessons. In other words, Buster, Romeo isn't in. My name is Romero. I am not Italian. Centuries old Spanish blood coursing through these veins, though my parents are not from Spain. And despite the Southern Californian accent, the loud words like dude, sweet, and sick to tumble gracefully from these lips. I'm not a white guy. I'm a Mexican. My name is Romero. Romero like a brand of tortillas that escaped with Guerrero and Mission from the segregation of the ethnic food section into the main aisles of your local supermarket. My name is Romero. Romero like Archbishop Oscar Romero, zombie filmmaker George A. Romero, actor Caesar Romero. Yes, before Jack Nicholson, before Heath Ledger, a brown man played the Joker. They dressed him in up in purple suit, green wig, and white face, though he would not shave. His trademark suave and sexy Latin mustache. No, he was a Romero. I am a Romero. My parents had dark hair and dark eyes. When I was seven, my brother lied, told me that my father was the mailman. How could you be the son of our parents with your blue eyes and white skin? Well, brother, Buster, like Jerry Springer, a Maori, the DNA results are in. I am a Romero, and I know what some of you are thinking, that I'm just another white guy trying to prove he's a Latino. Or just another Mexican, chest beating, beating his chest, beating whatever reputation he has left in the process, trying to convince you that his family, his country, his nationality are better than you. Well, I know as well as anyone, that we are all the children of Africa, roots of no single family tree, but of a flourishing forest that grows collectively towards a magnificent destiny, shining, radiating beauty. Just please close your eyes and you can see it. Ah, oh, but forget that ish. The name of this poem isn't, we are the world, we are the children, no. The name of this poem, my name is Romero, because if you're not proud of who you are, then what are you going to be proud of? And if you don't know where you come from, how are you supposed to know where you're going? And I know one thing, the name of my father, my father's father, and his father's father before him was Romero. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, and I love the language edits. It's really the F word instead of Buster, but that was dope. Nice. Seriously, yeah. that was amazing. Well, David is ever ah, so wonderful. I, I think we should unmute and just give him a huge round of applause. You're getting yes and orale. Thank you. Thank you for that. Beautiful. 
Thank you, David. Thank you. Yeah. I'm going to be contacting you because some of these poems, I think, really will speak to the topics I go over in my Latinx class. And I was thinking about the first one in the two teams who both yeah. happen to be schools in the East LA blowouts. And so Ooh. I definitely want to bring those in. So thank you. Great. I love it. Thank you. Thank I, you I love it. No, David, this was hands down one of your best performance. Your performance is always amazing, but oh, I just actually really enjoyed the events and thank you. Have to run to a meeting now. Yeah, girl, you go do those marathon meetings. Um, we will have uh, David again in the future. I, I think, you know, I, I say this, consider this your second home. Um, I love having you. I love having you and Matt on at the same time. And thank you. <laughs>